Turning the Heart to God by St. Theophan the Recluse St. Theophan's Introduction The main task on the way to salvation is to live in the Spirit of Christ. Anyone who broaches this subject will at once encounter many questions and many perplexities will be uncovered. That is why it is necessary to explain nearly every step of this way. Man's final goal is communion with God. The way to this goal lies through faith in Christ, together with constantly keeping His commandments with the assistance of God's grace. One needs only to say in addition, this is the way, follow it. It is easy to say this, but how is one to do it? For the most part, people have no desire to move in this direction. Their souls, pulled by one passion or another, stubbornly refuse every gentle invitation and every call. The soul averts its gaze from God and does not want to look at Him. The law of Christ does not conform to the soul's liking. The soul does not have a disposition even to hear this law. As the saying goes, the soul has a distaste for Christ's law. The questions to be addressed in this book are, how does one reach the point where the desire is born to move towards God by way of Christ? What does one do so that the law imprints itself, not just as ink on paper, but as the spirit of the living God imprints itself on the living flesh of the heart? How can a man act according to this law willingly and unconstrainedly, as if it came from himself, so that this law does not lie on him like a burden, but proceeds from his deepest nature? If someone has turned towards God and has come to love his law, is this enough to ensure the success of the journey? Is this turning the same as walking the path of Christ's law? Will the journey be successful merely because we desire it? No. In addition to the desire, it is necessary to have the strength and the ability to act, that is, active wisdom. Whoever enters this true way of pleasing God, whoever begins with the help of grace to strive towards God in the way of Christ's law, will inevitably be threatened by the danger of losing his way at the crossroads of going astray and perishing while under the illusion that he is working out his salvation. These crossroads are unavoidable because of our sinful inclinations and the disorder of our faculties, even in those who are converted. These sinful inclinations and disordered faculties are capable of presenting things to a man in a false light and deceiving and destroying the man. Moreover, In addition to these things, there is flattery from Satan, who is reluctant to leave his victims. When someone under his authority goes to the light of Christ, Satan pursues him and sets every manner of trap in order to catch him again. Not infrequently he succeeds. Consequently, the spiritual traveler, who already has the desire to follow the way to the Lord, must be informed of all the possible deviations so that he may be warned beforehand, may see the dangers that are to be encountered, and may learn how to avoid them. These unavoidable things, which are encountered on the way to salvation, and are common for everyone, require special guiding principles that are indispensable for the Christian life. These principles define how to acquire the saving desire for communion with God, the fervent desire to remain in communion with Him, and how to come to God safely through all the crossroads that must be negotiated on the way and at every stage on the way. In other words, how to begin to live the Christian life, and how, having begun, to perfect oneself in it. These guiding principles must take the man who is separated from God, turn him towards God, and then bring him into God's presence. They must show to the man the practical development of the Christian life in all its manifestations and levels, from its very beginning to the end. That is how the Christian life is sown, germinates, develops, and becomes mature. In other words, 
we must give an account of the unfolding of the act of life for every Christian, to show how he must act in every possible case so that he may stand firm in his calling. The sowing, germination, and development of the Christian life differs in essence from the sowing, germination, and development of the natural life. This difference is the result of the special character of the Christian life and its relationship to our human nature. A man is not born a Christian, but becomes such after birth. The seed of Christ falls on the soil of a heart that is already beating. Since the natural man is fallen, he is opposed to the demands of Christianity. In a plant, however, the beginning of life is the stirring of a sprout in the seed, an awakening of dormant powers. The beginning of a true Christian life in a man is a kind of recreation and rebirth, an endowment of new powers and of new life. Furthermore, although Christianity is accepted as law, that is, the resolution is made to live a Christian life, this seed of life, this resolution, is not surrounded in a man by conditions favorable to it. At this time, the whole man, in his body and soul, remains ill-adapted to the new life, refractory and not submissive to the yoke of Christ. From the moment of decision, a man begins hard labor, the labor to educate his whole self and all his faculties according to the Christian standard. That is why, whereas with the growth of plants, for example, there is a gradual development of the powers of the plant in an easy, unconstrained way, it is not so with a Christian. Rather, he has a hard struggle with himself, intense and sorrowful, and he must dispose his faculties towards things for which they have no natural inclination. Like a warrior, he must win every inch of land, even his own, from his enemies by means of warfare. He must use the two-edged sword of self-constraint and self-coercion. Finally, after long and hard labors and exertions, Christian principles emerge victorious, reigning without opposition. Having dislodged the demands and inclinations which are hostile to humanity from the hold of human nature, these principles penetrate our nature and place it in a state of purity and freedom from passions. These principles bestow upon a man the bliss of those who are pure in heart, so that the man can see God in himself in the most sincere communion with him. Such is the condition in us of the Christian life. It has three stages, which according to their characteristics, we may describe as follows. Turning to God, which is conversion, purification or self-amendment, and sanctification. In the first stage, a man turns from darkness to light, from the reign of Satan to God, in the second, he cleanses the dwelling chamber of his heart from every impurity in order to receive Christ the Lord, who is coming to him. In the third, the Lord comes, makes his home in the heart of a man, and sups with him. This is the state of blessed communion with God, the goal of all ascetic labors and endeavors. To show the way to salvation means that we must describe all these things and define the rules which govern their operation. Full guidance in this matter takes a man on the crossroads of sin, leads him through the fiery way of cleansing, and raises him up to the highest pitch of spiritual perfection attainable, to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In other words, this guidance must show us how the Christian life begins in us, how it is perfected, that is, how it grows and is strengthened, and how the Christian life appears in its full perfection. Chapter 1. How the Christian Life Begins The beginning of a grace-given Christian life is established in baptism, but few people preserve this grace for long. Most Christians lose it. In their actual lives, we see that many people are more or less corrupted. They have principles which are not sound, but which were permitted to develop and take root. Others may have good principles, but while still young, these people, 
whether according to their own inclination or because they were seduced by others, forget about these principles and gradually get used to what is harmful. Such people no longer have the true Christian life within themselves. They must begin it anew. Our holy faith offers the sacrament of confession for this. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So if you have sinned, then acknowledge your sin and repent. God will forgive you your sin and put within you a new heart and a new spirit. There is no other way at all. Either do not sin or repent. Judging from the multitude of those who fall into sin after baptism, one must say that repentance has become for us the only source of true Christian life. In some people the gift of the grace-filled life, which was already received and acting in them through baptism, is only cleansed and rekindled by means of the sacrament of confession. With others who are more deeply mired in sin, the beginning of this new life is re-established only through the sacrament of confession. We shall begin to consider the sacrament of confession from this latter case. In this latter case, confession is a radical change for the better, a sudden change of will, a turning away from sin towards God, a rekindling of the fire of fervent desire for the exceptional pleasing of God with the denial of self and all other things. Most of all, it is characterized by a painful change of will. A man is accustomed to what is evil. Now he must tear himself away from sin. He has offended God. Now he must burn in the fire of the incorruptible and impartial judgment of his conscience. A repentant man feels an anguish like that of a woman in childbirth. In the feelings of his heart, he touches to a certain extent the punishment of hell. To a lamenting Jeremiah, God gave the commandment to destroy and to build and plant anew. The lamenting spirit of repentance was sent to the earth by the Lord to pierce those who accept it to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. This same spirit was sent in order to destroy our old self and lay the foundation for making a new man within us. Within the repenting man there is sometimes a sense of fear, sometimes a slight hope, sometimes a keen sense of his own deep pain, sometimes a slight feeling of consolation. Sometimes he experiences the terrors of near despair. Sometimes he feels the gentle breezes of joy and consolation evoking the mercy of God, all in turn. All these feelings make a man feel as if he were a decomposing corpse, as if he were departing from this life, but with the hope of receiving new life. This state is painful, but salutary. It is so unavoidable that one who has not experienced such a painful change has not yet begun to live through repentance. There is no hope that a man might overcome himself and begin to cleanse himself from all his impurity without having first passed through this furnace of repentance. The resolute, firm, and active resistance to sin can come only from a hatred of sin. Hatred of sin comes from an experience of the harm which is produced by sin. The feeling of harm from sin is experienced in all its might during this painful change through repentance. Only at this point does a man feel with all his heart how great an evil sin is. From henceforth, he will flee from sin as from fires of hell. Although someone may begin to cleanse himself without this painful experience, he will do so only slightly, more outwardly than inwardly, more in his actions than in his inner disposition. Therefore, his heart will still remain unclean, like ore which has not been refined. Such a change is engendered in a man's heart by divine grace. Only this grace can inspire a man to raise his hand against himself in order to slay himself and sacrifice himself to God. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. God himself gives a man a new heart 
and a new spirit. A worldly man feels pity for himself, having merged with the flesh and sin. He has become one with them. Only the supreme power can divide him into two parts and arm him against himself. Therefore, the change in a sinner is produced by God's grace, yet it does not occur without the participation of his free will. In baptism, this grace is given at the moment that the sacrament is completed upon us. In the case of baptism, free will comes later and assimilates the grace which was given to it. But in repentance, free will must participate in the very act of the change itself. This change for the better and turning to God must be as if it were instantaneous, and indeed this is so. Although this change is instantaneous, the person passes through several preparatory stages during which his freedom is united with grace. In these stages, grace gradually takes possession of freedom, while freedom submits itself to grace. These stages are necessary for everyone. Some people pass through them quickly, but for others it takes years. Who can understand everything that is happening here, especially since there are so many ways that grace acts upon us, and the states of people upon which it acts are so innumerable? One must understand, however, that for all this variety, there is one common order of change, and no one can avoid it. Everyone who repents is a person who is living in sin, and every such person is changed by grace. Therefore, based on an understanding of the state of a sinner in general, and understanding the relation of freedom to grace, one can depict this process and determine its rules.